So one of the community relationships that we talked about was predator or prey and herbivory, which more or less are the same thing. You have one organism that is consuming another organism. Now to kind of understand those relationships more, because it's, it's probably the most common relationship we see in communities, obviously organisms don't want to be eaten. Obviously plants don't want to be eaten. If you get eaten, that stops reproduction. Your genes are not passing on to the next generation. So this lecture is all about defense mechanisms. What do plants have in place? What do animals have in place? Know that bacteria and fungi also have defense mechanisms. What do they have in place that are kind of helping them in preventing them from getting consumed? And we'll talk a little bit about predators as well, some of the adaptations they might have. So in general, we can I divide our defenses into two major categories. We have mechanical defenses, and then the next one we'll talk about are chemical defenses. So mechanical defenses are physical attributes of that organism that is either inflicting pain on the predator, or it's somehow preventing the predator from actually eating that organism. And so these are things that you see, you feel, uh, you notice about this organism. So for example, our lovely sea turtles, um, sea turtles cannot put in all of their limbs, but their vital organs are found within their shell. This shell is an incredibly hard defense mechanism against its predators, uh, primarily sharks. So uh, although this one's not inflicting pain, it is preventing uh, predators from really killing this turtle. Yes, this turtle could still get hurt, so it could lose a flipper, but it's still alive at the end of the day. So here's an example of preventing a predator. Another example looking at our plant world is uh, inflicting pain on another. So this tree that you see here is called the monkey no climb tree. You're familiar probably with thorns on other bushes and plants and whatnot, but here's thorns on a tree, uh, which is kind of rare uh, in comparison to our uh, standalone plants. And so they call it the monkey no climb tree, just thinking about larger organisms such as monkeys uh, and related organisms preventing, say, getting to the fruit or the leaves or whatnot of this tree. And so this is an example of a physical defense, right? You see it, you can feel it, but the goal of this one, and same with thorns, or maybe spikes like a porcupine, is to actually inflict pain on that predator. When thinking about a porcupine, you know, a, a coyote goes to eat it, it physically gets hurt from um, the morphology of that organism. So we see this in the plant world, we see this in the animal world. We don't really see it too much in the fungi world and definitely not, or I shouldn't say definitely not, uh, but probably not in the bacterial world. Uh, they do have some defenses, but not really mechanical defenses. So we typically see mechanical defenses in Kingdom Animalia and Kingdom Plantae. So this is one group of defenses. A second group of defenses are chemical defenses. So toxins that are released when, particularly when you go to consume something. Now, this is a little bit different than saying uh, a snake that is biting something and injecting venom into it. Although that is a chemical, that's not really a defense mechanism. That's a, that's a hunting mechanism. Um, so this is more of something you eat or you're consuming and you're getting sick from it. Uh, the goal of that organism is that you won't eat that organism again. So the plant world, you probably are familiar with this at some point in your life, you have probably gotten poison ivy. We have lots of poison ivy here in Maryland. And so poison ivy, poison oak, poison sumac, all of these really great defenses against herbivores. Thinking about caterpillars, as particularly caterpillars, um, things like aphids, other types of beetles. There's a lot of insects that really like plants. And if this plant can create a toxin in order to prevent uh, organisms from eating it, it's a great defense mechanism, right? Plants can't pick off predators, so they have to rely on these chemical defenses. Also great with humans too. Uh, if we want to get rid of a plant, we have to uh, wear protective gear or we might not even notice it. 
in the animal kingdom. Um, there's lots of different organisms that are poisonous if you eat them, not just for humans, but poisonous to other organisms. The organism you see here, this is a lionfish. It's actually an invasive species here in, there's not many cases in Maryland. It's a little bit further south in warmer waters. So these guys, um, they have these spikes. The spikes themselves aren't really that harmful. Uh, most fish have uh, spiky bones in their fins. But the thing about these spikes is they actually deliver poison. So if something goes to eat this lionfish, then that organism is going to get poisoned by this lionfish. Now, poison doesn't necessarily mean it kills you. It really could just be leaving a really bad taste in your mouth. But as a predator, if I try to eat this fish again, I'm going to associate, oh, that tastes really gross. I don't want to eat that again. And that predator will likely look for something else, something different. Now, before moving on, I have this video here. It's a compilation of 10 different defenses, some of them very clearly physical or mechanical, some of them very clearly chemical, some of them kind of in this weird juxtaposition. Uh, when watching this video, see which ones you can classify into chemical or physical and see which ones you're like, I don't know which way this could go. It's not clear cut. There's tons of defenses out there. So again, before moving on, uh, go ahead and watch this compilation video and take some notes uh, as to different examples of these defense mechanisms. The video link's popping up here. Pause here and then come back in a moment. So hopefully you learned about some pretty cool things. Um, some of my favorite defenses that um, I've seen in other videos is a sea cucumber that literally melts itself. Um, <laughs> and usually it dies from it. It's like a 50-50 chance if it dies. Uh, so it's not like a super awesome defense mechanism, but it exists. So really cool things that organisms do out there in order to not die. A, I don't really want to call it a third type of defense. I guess it's, it's not mechanical, right? It's not something that's going to protect it physically. It's not chemical because there, there's no poison. It has to do with colors. The color of an organism could be a defense mechanism. And so that's what the rest of this lecture is going to talk about is coloration. Uh, there's four different types of colorings that we'll talk about. Not every organism fits into one of these four types. Some organisms just look the way they do. For example, humans like the color of our skin has nothing to do with predator prey. Um, so I don't want you to think that every single organism fits in one of these categories. But there's some great examples of organisms that do. So let's start with aposomatic coloration. These are the brightly crazy colored organisms. Um, the, the poison dart, let me put it, pictures up. The poison dart frog, those neon green frogs. Here is a blue ringed octopus. Who knows how it got its name? Um, these bright colors are warning colors. These are indicating to predators that they're dangerous. They're either toxic, most of them are toxic, um, that they're poisonous if you eat them. Uh, but it's possible that it's also they have some sort of um, sting or some sort of bite, um, some sort of warning symbol. Think about yourself. You've probably seen tons of different animals in your life. Uh, and if you saw a bright orange tree frog, you're like, this is the coolest thing ever. And you go and you pick it up and then your hand starts feeling super numb uh, because it released some poison through its skin and it's starting to poison you and you're going numb and maybe you go to the hospital and you know, it's not a good time. You go out again and there's tons of frogs out there, but you see a bright orange frog you nearly instantly remember, hey, that's bad. <laughs> and you remember it. But if it was a green frog or a gray frog or a brown frog, there's tons of those, right? And most of them are totally fine. But the ones that stick out the most are the ones that are remembered by predators. Animals have memories too, right? This is not just a human thing. So a snake that maybe tries to go and eat one of these frogs gets a bad taste in its mouth. Maybe it gets incredibly sick, who knows? But it can remember, hey, that was bad. Brighter colors and unique colorations are a lot easier to remember than bland colorations. 
Now think about how this evolves, because the thing is, is this blue ring octopus wasn't like, you know what, I'm, I'm super poisonous, I'm gonna get these blue rings. It has to do, go back to natural selection, it all goes back to natural selection. So with this octopus within this species, um, it might have had a range, maybe they were all gray, some of them had maybe small blue spots, nothing extreme to what we see right here. And all of them poisonous, and all of them getting eaten, God, I don't even know what eats octopi, uh, we're going to say sharks, I have no idea if that's true. Anyway, sharks go to eat these octopi, <clears throat> and they keep getting poisoned, and it's like, hmm, this doesn't taste good, maybe I should, I, I should avoid it. Well, the octopi that were a little blander in color, they're still getting eaten. Even though, yes, they had this poison, but the, the sharks weren't remembering that. Uh, it's, ooh, it's a gray octopus. They're all gray. Sharks that ate a octopus of the same species that maybe had more of these blue dots might have learned, oh, I ate this one with blue dots. I can remember this blue dots. That's very unique. That's very weird. And when they saw one in the future, they didn't eat it. And so the octopi that had these bluer spots were surviving more because their predators were remembering them. Those that had this blander coloration, they, they looked like other species. They didn't stand out at all, and so they kept getting eaten. Multiply this by thousands, if not millions of generations, and we now have this octopus that has very, very bold coloration that can be remembered by sharks, by Dolphins, by humans, by other organisms. You can say the same thing with the frogs. So these colorations, again, are not being chosen. Uh, this dart frog wasn't like, you know what? I should be bright orange. Predators are going to remember that. No, it's just the predators stop eating the bright ones because they were able to associate that with bad, with don't eat. The ones that happen to be a little blander in color, they're like, well, it looks like this other one. Uh, I think it's the same. Well, I'm going to eat it. Oh, well, it ends up being poisonous. I'll try to avoid it, but they really can't. So that is our uh, aposomatic coloration. So aposomatic just saying really bright colors, warning colors to those predators.